Leading crowdsourcing practitioners share their tales, trials, and triumphs. This is Loud About Crowdsourcing. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for tuning in to Loud About Crowdsourcing, a bi-weekly podcast about how crowdsourcing is changing the world and how things get done. I am one of your hosts, Will Price. I am a technical architect working at Top Coder, and I'm joined today by Clinton and Nick. Guys, say hello. Hello, everybody. We are thrilled to be bringing this to you. Uh, Clinton Bonner, I'm also with Top Coder, focused on marketing and also uh, innovation programs and, and all that jazz. So very excited to be talking about something we love. Nick Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Nick Castillo. I am the community manager here at Top Coder as well. Very excited to kick this off, introduce uh, crowdsourcing, get into the nitty gritty, and uh, yeah, get everyone excited about crowd. Awesome. Well, guys, what are your interests outside of crowdsourcing? I'll start because I asked the question and I <laughs> wanted to answer it as soon as I asked it. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a Boston guy. I'm a huge Boston sports fan. So that's a big, uh, big part of my life is following those religiously. Uh, I'm also I'm also a big uh, gamer outside of uh, you know my coding uh, expertise. I'll I'll do a lot of uh, gaming on the side. Those are some of my my passions. But uh, I think programming and crowdsourcing content is uh, pretty high up there now too. Cool. I'll go next because I'm pretty similar. Uh, I love sports as well. Although Washington D.C. is is are my teams. So you know you got the Wizards, the Caps, Nationals especially. Uh, into video games as well. Sometimes I play with Will Price every now and then, uh, you know, on PlayStation. And, uh, yeah, I like to make videos on the side too. So, hey, maybe we'll, we'll do a video podcast one day, like a special. We'll see. So, <laughs> I bet Clinton is a big sports fan too. Clinton, are you I a sports fan? I might be. I might be. You know, the, the, the trifecta might be complete here. So, yeah, I, I am certainly a big, big sports fan for sure. Uh, I am born and raised in Long Island, so naturally I'm a Seattle Seahawks fan. I know that. that naturally. Uh, <laughs> naturally. So, big Seahawks fan. I actually blog for a blog for a Seahawks podcast called the Seahawkers Podcast as well. So, that's a big passion of mine. Um, I don't particularly game. I used to, of course, but I got kids. And they game all the time, so I, I kind yeah, of nice. game vicariously. So a lot of, a lot of Nint- Nintendo Wii U. But besides mm-hmm. family and all that good stuff, my big passion is music as well. So I've been playing uh, different rock bands and different different, uh, and not just the video game rock band, but different bands for qu- quite a number of years, and still tinker around the acoustic and jam out with my friends a lot. And uh, at this point, teaching my six year old son how to play guitar is one of my greatest joys too. So that's a lot of fun. I'm thinking awesome. we could uh, have a theme song, maybe created by our our own Clinton Bonner. Wow, <laughs> I like it. I'll, I'll take the challenge. Yes. Yeah, that just made my job a whole lot easier. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I mentioned earlier, this is the Loud About Crowdsourcing podcast. We have not talked about crowdsourcing yet, but we're going to. Uh, I wanted to just quickly say, you know, what we're doing here, uh, why we're doing this. So, uh, as you may have heard earlier uh, in the in the podcast, we all work for Top Coder. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit later about what Top Coder is and what it does, uh, but we're all very passionate about crowdsourcing and the way it's changing how work gets done in the world today. Um, So our podcast, the goal here is to bring interesting stories uh, of success and of failure uh, using crowdsourcing in the enterprise today uh, or in the um, small and medium business markets or even consumer level as well. There's really a lot of great stories uh, to discuss. Um, We're also looking to uh, bring in some thought leaders in the crowdsourcing industry, uh, people from companies large and small who have experience running programs, running projects uh, through through the crowd. And uh, we want to talk a bit about the latest trends in crowdsourcing uh, and in the industry. Um, So that's our mission. I think you nailed it, man. That's that's the purpose, right? It's to... To, you know, we, we get to live in this in this bit of a bubble that we do work for Top Coder, and then we just see all this cool stuff happening in crowdsourcing, and it's always pretty amazing that mo- most folks still don't realize the the amazing things that are hap- happening, and not just Top Coder, just in crowdsourcing in general, how things are getting done. So if we could bring more people to the light and they could see just the 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 immense amount of really the progress that's happening through crowd. 
That's great. You know, that, that'll be a win right there and uh, hopefully get, you know, have some uh, have some passionate discussions and have some laughs along the way. And I think we've got the the recipe for success right there, I believe. So. All right. So we talked about crowdsourcing, why we want to talk about it. But maybe we should talk a little bit uh, in our first episode here about what is crowdsourcing. So uh, Clinton, Nick. I know this is, something, this is something that's come up a lot uh, over my career in crowdsourcing is people ask me what I do, and I say I crowdsource. And that means something different to everyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you guys usually hear when so, uh, someone tries to uh, – says what, or when someone tells you what crowdsourcing means to them? Yeah, so like typically if, if I get asked what I do, you know, I say I'm in crowdsourcing and they're like, oh, okay, so, so you're like in Kickstarter or you, you're one of those kind of companies. And what they're really talking about is crowdfunding, um, which can be, I guess, a type of crowdsourcing, but um, not exactly what we do at Top Coder, which we may get into a little later. But, but I think crowdfunding is, is one of the big things that people think about when they hear the word crowdsourcing. Very close, but um, but not really exactly what we do. <laughs> what do you think, Clinton? So I think, yeah, so I think crowdfunding, you know, almost always comes up like A1. It's like, oh, Kickstarter, like, and like you said, like, yeah, it's, a, it's almost knee jerk at this point. Like, no, nah, not exactly. Um, mm-hmm. Although there's some great stories out there and Kickstarter is cool to watch and all that Indiegogo and they're all, they're all fun. But also um, a lot of folks tend to think of it as something – quite simple or like meant for simple things like social voting right so it's like oh i'm gonna crowdsource this idea or even just you know what do you think of this and let me put it out on facebook and you know look at me i'm crowdsourcing that's fine and that's all good and that is again a that's a a form of of just kind of social crowdsourcing so it it all kind of fits under the greater umbrella of crowdsourcing and i think one of the points of the podcast are to get like way more granular and showcase uh, showcase things that are happening that uh, most people probably just don't realize are being crowdsourced and and the kind of uh, results they're getting. But that's that's it. I think a lot of people think of it of a as either crowdfunding or a simple, a really simple like social voting thing. When actually it's uh, in many ways it's just new ways to get work, really cool work accomplished. So and then Will, did you have anything uh, extra to add on? You know, from your point of view. Yeah, actually, I'm kind of shocked that you guys didn't bring up uh, crowdsourcing data. So I mean, my favorite mm. app that I use every day almost is Waze. And how does Waze get its traffic data? It's from, from the crowd. All the users of the app uh, send their data back to Waze, who aggregates it and then presents it. Um, that's really the number one thing I think of when I think of uh, crowdsourcing outside of what we do in our day to day. Uh, but the ability to gather data uh, from all over the place, and that's done in market research. It's done in location information. Uh, we a million different ways that people are starting to gather uh, data from from crowdsourcing communities or just from users of their applications who really create a community and create a crowd. Well, I think you've sufficiently shamed both Nick and I with your <laughs> superior, your much superior answers. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> crowdsourcing is a concept that you hear more about today, but it's not new. It's not new by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, there are actually some really interesting examples of crowdsourcing uh, throughout history, many of which I didn't even know about until I just got involved and started doing it myself and seeing you know marketing decks and talking to customers. And you know, you, you start learning about the industry that you work in and thinking, you know, I, I came into this industry thinking it's all high tech, it's all cutting edge, it's it's as cool as it gets. But that's not necessarily the case. I mean, I guess it's always the cool, it's the cool part's always there, but uh, but but the new and cutting edge isn't necessarily there. So we wanted to share a couple stories um, of the origins of crowdsourcing. Yeah, I mean, um, although crowdsourcing, uh, the term was coined in like 2005, the idea of it did st- uh, begin you know, long time ago. One of the examples that I like to talk about is, you know, back in around 1795, uh, some of you are familiar with Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, He actually, his army was conquering Europe and he couldn't keep his soldiers' food from spoiling. So he offered uh, a prize. He offered 12,000 francs to anyone who could innovate food preservation. So, you know, 
we need to feed our soldiers, but they keep you know expiring. We need this problem solved. So I'm just going to put it out there to anyone who could possibly fix this, and uh, you know you you win this prize. So 15 years later, uh, a confectioner uh, by the name of Nicolas Francois Appert or Appert. I don't know how to exactly pronounce that. <laughs> He's the one who won the prize. Um, and he he was boiling and sealing food in airtight jars. That's how he ended up uh, uh, accomplishing this task. So, I mean, it this is a pretty cool example of, of how crowdsourcing was used, you know, way back when, um, just to discover different types of solutions to, to problems. And I'm sure that wasn't the only... Uh, I guess you could call it technically a submission, right? So I'm sure a lot of people uh, entered in this competition hoping to get those 12,000 francs, but but this confectioner was the only one to do it uh, exceptionally and, uh, you know, without fail. So so he won. And that was, that's a great example, I think, of, of how crowdsourcing almost began, like even way back then. So... Um, but it's uh, <laughs> it's it's interesting, and I, I as you were telling that story, uh, I thought of something, and you know who who tested this stuff, preserving the food? You know, did someone taste test after you know x amount of time? What happened with all the failed submissions? That's like Correct. the untold story that I kind of want to know now. <laughs> that would be interesting, but maybe that's also why it took like fifteen years because the testing. They're like, will it withstand you know the test of time type thing, right? <laughs> Yeah, or they food they see. gave food poisoning to our or botulism <laughs> oh, to everyone, no. and they had to keep replacing their reviewers. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh boy! All right, another another story. Uh, this one that jumps out at me uh, a lot is uh, the longitude rewards. So this uh, was basically a giant contest uh, that was organized by the British government uh, in the early 1700s. Um, they, they went as uh, Parliament went as far to pass uh, the Longitude Act. Uh, it was passed in 1714, and they created the Board of Longitude, which was a whole bunch of really smart folks who were reviewing, basically reviewing uh, people's ideas. What they were doing was offering uh, 20,000 pounds to someone who found a way to uh, accurately track longitude while you're at sea uh, within one degree accuracy. And then they had different prizes for, um, for for different ranges of accuracy. So you got some money if you could get within five degrees uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, they even gave advances of payments to teams that were coming up with really uh, promising plans. Um, so there was, there was a guy, his name was uh, John Harrison. He was a watchmaker. And he started working on it uh, when he was 21 years old. And he worked on it for the next 40 years of his life, uh, eventually inventing the marine chronometer. Uh, he won, I think, over 24,000 pounds uh, over the course of the contest. Uh, and his methodologies became uh, used throughout the world. Uh, he didn't win the full prize, interestingly enough. Huh. Uh, but... You know, he w- he was kind of the winner, but there were prizes paid out to uh, a-, a number of people uh, over the course of that. And really, uh, you know, how how did you get to you know navigate the world? You know, crowdsourcing had a, a part in that for sure, uh, and you know, probably saved a lot of lives too from from shipwrecks. That is amazing, just to kind of like almost dedicate your life to like trying to f- solve this one problem. You. You would think what he if he had some sort of side job to keep you know <laughs> his living expenses paid. Well, I mean, I'd imagine uh, in 1714, 23,000 pounds was not insignificant. That's how much he won. I just I just fact checked it. It's uh, 23,000 pounds was won by him, but then there were uh, about 10 other folks who won some amount of uh, money from the longitude rewards. Uh, yeah, I, feel as like, well. I, feel like, I feel like this guy was rolling around like Scrooge McDuck style back back in that <laughs> era with 23,000 pounds, but he did spend a lifetime, you know, uh, trying to get this achieved, right? Which is, which is really, really incredible. And I think that, you know, look, the, look at those two stories right there, like canned foods change the world and uh, longitude changed how we got around the world, navigation, transportation, kind of changed it forever. And that's one of the really cool parts of crowdsourcing is uh, that they, that there are these these tales throughout the the ages of of um, changing human history through this idea of like prize based challenges and, and crowdsourcing, and you know 
we think about it back then and it, and it's you had to have a really um huge megaphone back then you had to be napoleon you had to be you know like the the, the strongest government in the world to be able to decree something like that and get people's attention and then you had to let the information dissipate and get to far-reaching corners or different cities and then you had to have this huge long 15 years or 40 years of experimentation to try to solve something and then you look at today and you say, well, what, what's changed, right? I mean, taking taking us through the history real real quickly, like take another pit stop real quick, you know, the, the printing press certainly changed things dramatically. And if you think about like that kind of era, the printing press and then like aviation, a lot of folks don't know the, the, the story of like, you know, Charles Lind Lindbergh, the, uh, the first cr uh, uh, cross Atlantic uh, flights. That was a prize. That was that was prize based. So you know, at that era, you had you had newspapers um, you know, distributing the information and getting many different pilots engaged. But the first you know the first flight to ever go from like New York what was it New York to Paris and New York to England, whatever it was across the Atlantic uh, in one flight. That was done by that was also because of of a prize competition, which is just incredible. And then as we hit the fast forward button a bit more, then you start to get into the the age of computers, right? And the and the internet, and you start to look at prize competitions like uh, what Peter Diamandis created with X Prize, and and creating the entire um, the the entire new age space race that's happening right now by putting out an X Prize for uh, for you know anybody that's non government to. Uh, put up you know put a ship into uh, a certain elevation of orbit two times within with within a certain number of days right and it totally changed the game from um, it totally changed the entire space travel game uh, probably forever and and we're seeing the consequences of that now which again is crowdsourcing and then we look at even a little bit forward to today and, and what's happened even in the last 10 or 15 years is that the technology has become widely distributed that most people or vast majority vast chunks of people have access to good Wi-Fi vast chunks of people have access to cheap computing power and because of that platforms have, have evolved and opportunities to do work in a distributed manner have evolved kind of naturally so what used to take literally in, in the longitude prize 40 years to go accomplish something um, can now you know large-scale crowdsourcing challenges could be stood up in a matter of days or weeks and hundreds of people or thousands of people from around the globe could be contributing near instantaneously to the efforts now it is a sea change and um, and again it's kind of one of the one of the exciting things but you know you could always learn from the past uh, and, and these stories I think help bring us to today and be like when we say we're excited about this, like there's reasons why this is game game changing stuff. So, from my angle, it's like love the past stories and then look look what's happening now and how fast computing is now. And oh by the way, many billions more people are about to get mobile phones for the first time ever in their lives. If people think this is actually going to slow down, you know, I would just bet against them. Um, you know, eight days a week. Let's put it that way. So that's uh, that's that's kind of my side of the coin. Is like looking to the future with this. It's it's super exciting, and uh, and th those stories from the past just just kind of hammer it home. Well, I think when you uh, when you talk about crowdsourcing and crowdsourcers specifically, um, you know, we are a, sm a small number now. The the folks who facilitate these crowdsourcing uh, processes, at least you know, relative to the global population, there, there's there's few of us. Um, but I do think we're pretty vocal. Uh, it's almost in some ways like it can be a cult. Like you get exposed to it, and then suddenly you just engross yourself uh, in it. And I feel like everyone I know who works in the industry of crowdsourcing has a story. You know, how did they get started? What was uh, what was it that hooked them and made them a believer? Because every time I've uh, ever explained the concept um, to someone that that's you know coming in totally blind and not you know didn't come to me asking about it, but you know I'm talking to them and initiating the conversation about crowdsourcing, uh, I'm usually met with skepticism. Uh, and, and that's, you know, how can you incentivize people who don't work for you to do something that's high quality? How do you know they're not going to, you know, try and steal your information or hack your data? Or, or you know, there's a million things that I hear about that. But uh, oftentimes, as you work it all, work through all those questions, and you get to the point where you actually get to run some work and do something with a crowd and see the results that come back it's like a it's like a switch gets flipped and suddenly it's like oh 
I get it. Like, I'm a believer now. Uh, I know I certainly had that moment. Uh, can, can I safely assume that both of you guys have had that moment, too? Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I could definitely, uh, you know, speak to that, especially since uh, I actually came from a company that worked with Top Coder uh, called Brevo Labs. And before even that, I myself had no idea that this space even existed. Um, you know, you think, oh, okay, you know, you work for a company, everyone in this company is contributing to whatever project that they're working on, and it's very internal, this is all we do. Um, so then we experimented. Um, one of the guys that I worked with in Brevo Labs had experience with TopCoder before, and we were able to bring TopCoder in and help us develop apps. Now within like a year, I think we developed probably over 15 different apps, maybe more. Um, and it was just so exciting to me and, and just being able to be a part of it as well. Uh, I would come up with some uh, idea of an of a awesome app to use. We were, I like to think that we were kind of cutting edge, uh, maybe a little bit before our time, but um, I think what we were developing was kind of like, you know, social login to the physical world, being able to use your Facebook account to gain access to, you know, a Starbucks door since you like them on Facebook, you know, something along those lines, for example. Um, so we, we started building this out. We, we used TopCoder to build our own API. We used TopCoder to build um, kind of these uh, promotional apps. Uh, um, what do you call it? Prototypes. So we, we'd create a bunch of prototypes and, and, and get these ideas in action. And I was fortunate to be a part of this, you know, run my own projects, uh, interact with the members of Top Coder. So, you know, these people are all over the world. Um, but to be able to communicate with them, tell them exactly what you're looking for. They're like, okay, I got it. They write up the spec for you. They're like, okay, guys, this is what we're looking for. You know, they have me review it as well. So, you know, they just make sure that they have all their ducks in a, in a row. They have everything you want in there. And it's amazing because something something as, you know, much as building a prototype from, like, the ground up took, like, <laughs> geez, you know, depending on what it was, maybe, like, two weeks to a month um, some of that would include actually designing the app as well. So being able to like run certain challenges in parallel to each other. So it, it, everything gets developed so quickly. You as a client would have like the reins as well, being able to control like, yeah, I really don't like, you know, the way that this is uh, looking or the way that this is functions. Can we change it? Um, and they're like, yeah, absolutely. And to be able to get multiple submissions in, multiple people that you know are are working for this this prize and and it's typically not only just a first place prize you know sometimes we we would have multiple prizes so that uh it's more inviting to to other members but in the end we would just get the result that we were looking for and i thought that was amazing and that's kind of what drew me to top coder it, it's along the lines of what clinton was talking about i think for me um which is that you you kind of can see the future of this, what it could potentially be. I think it's something that a, a lot of companies will begin to start gravitating to, um, you know, in the future. And I wanted to be a part of it. And so that's why I hopped aboard. That's why I'm, you know, helping out with the community, getting them excited about, you know, all the work that's been coming in, promoting all these challenges um, from our clients and, you know, celebrating them, you know, from time to time. They're doing amazing work, and, and they need to be showcased as well. So I wanted to be a part of it. I'm now part of it, very excited to, and I'm glad to be on this podcast and, uh, you know, show what my journey was uh, to crowdsourcing. So <laughs> that, uh, uh, that was a good story, Nick, and it was a very uh, kind of holistic view of everything. My first story is probably a little more selfish than yours. <laughs> um, so... Uh, my aha moment where I got hooked on crowdsourcing, uh, it came when I uh, was a pretty new employee at, um, at a company called Imperio, which uh, is you know, but now the parent company of uh, Top Coder. Um, you know, so 
we had our own kind of crowdsourcing community. Um, they call it Cloud Spokes. Uh, it was put together uh, by by these by two guys, uh, Dave Messenger and Jeff Douglas, who uh, were the guys who really introduced me to it. But my scenario was I was uh, I was 25 years old. I was uh, doing Salesforce consulting, and I was on my first project, first time ever consulting in my life, and. They, they, the operations team said, you know, well, fly to Florida. Uh, you're the tech lead on this project. And my, in, in my head, my first reaction was like, oh, no, I'm the tech lead on this project. Like, mm-hmm. I've never consulted before. What am I going to do? So I get down there and I, you know, start going through the meetings, the discovery, understanding what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, and I feel like I'm doing a pretty good job. Uh, and then we get into starting to configure Salesforce and, and actually deliver on the vision that we had. And we get to one of the technical problems that was going to require writing some code. And Salesforce is called, uh, it, it was Apex, called Apex. And you know, I, was, I was pretty strong in the configuration space at the time, but hadn't done a lot of development. Uh, we have a development team uh, uh, over in Jaipur, uh, but they were all they were all booked up. Like they didn't have any capacity to take on the work that I needed to get done. And I was panicking. I'm like, my consulting career is going to be over, you know, four months in, uh, because I'm not gonna be able to deliver this. I don't know what I'm going to do. And I got introduced to Jeff and, uh, and Dave and they said, Hey, why don't you try out this cloud smokes thing? We have, we have, you know, uh, you know, thousands of developers, they know Salesforce and they taught me how to frame my problem, like a question. Uh, or like a challenge and say, you know, go solve this problem. Basically, we took the issue that I was having and we put a bounty on it. And we, we put a bounty on its head. We said, someone kill this for us and show us you killed it. Like, that's what it is. It's like the old West, right? Um, so we posted it up. And then a week later, we had submissions. And I had a bunch of submissions and we had instructions and I started installing them into development environments and testing them out. And just like that, it was solved. You know, my my... Fear for my career had abated. I was feeling much better about everything. The customer was thrilled, and I immediately bought in. And I said, you know, I would have been in trouble if uh, if I hadn't sent this to the crowd. And I feel like it worked out well for everyone. It worked out well for me. It worked out <laughs> great for my customer. And it worked out well for the members of the community who won prizes on that. And even those who didn't win prizes and submitted <clears throat> something got feedback and they learned something and they got to see the winning submissions and learn what it takes to improve their own work. So, you know, win or lose uh, in the challenge, you know, everyone involved in the process came out ahead. Uh, and it really opened my eyes to what can be accomplished if you break out of the norms and everything that you just understand as the way things work. Uh, and that was my light switch moment. I continued using uh, cloud spokes throughout the life of that uh, that community. Uh, eventually, Aperio acquired Topcoder. Uh, we we rolled those two communities together, and I transitioned onto the Topcoder team full time uh, as a technical architect, uh, just working exclusively with the crowd. Because you know, once I once I got a taste, I just had to keep going, and I did. And here I am now. <laughs> Uh, hosting a podcast about it so that's a pretty <laughs> cool story i think uh that's awesome and it's yeah it's that's when i drank the kool-aid for sure so so ma- well. major, yeah you are yeah, <laughs> a major major takeaway major moment for me on that story will is that you you are a young pup and i am very old compared oh, to no. <laughs> my, my word and they're, they're flying you down at 26 years old to lead a project look at this guy <laughs> you know sipping cristal on the plane i imagine right That's um and and, and, nick, you're, <laughs> yeah, and, and nick you're a young dude too so i mean i, I think i am uh my bones hurt after hearing ha- the Whatever. Year before, but- <laughs> well, well then elder statesman what's your story <laughs> <laughs> I, I am young at heart i am young at heart so um so I'm not a technologist, nor am I a designer. So my my day to day would not be possible without crowdsourcing. So and, that, and that's just the reality of it. But without giving, um, you know, like like that kind of crowdsourcing story for me, it was before I even got into uh, crowdsourcing for uh, for work. It was this is more around like 2004, 2005, where um, I'm, at that time I'm, I'm waiting tables, I'm doing mortgages because it's the mid 2000s. So who who isn't slinging mortgages at that point? And I'm also playing lots of music, and I'm playing out quite a bit. And um, 
I'm at a, at a uh, place that doesn't exist anymore, a uh, great, great rock hall in, in New London. It was a cool bar called Station 58. It was a converted a converted firehouse. Wish it was still there because it, uh, it was a great, great spot. And I'm going to see a band, and, um, <clears throat> you know, I had heard a good, good local band that I had heard that they had, like, you know, lost their drummer very recently. And all of a sudden, um, you know, uh, they, they didn't miss a beat. There's There they are back on stage or whatever, like three weeks later, they didn't even skip the show. So I'm talking to one of the guitarists afterwards. I'm like, I'm like what, how, what happened here? Like, did you just have somebody just waiting in the wings? Like, you found a really good drummer and you learned all your songs and all this stuff. And he's like, he's like, oh, well, we, we put out a Craigslist ad. He's like, we had an open rehearsal. He's like, we had like six or seven dudes show up. He's like, a couple of them were, eh, couple of them really cool and at that point we made just like a, a choice on who we wanted to hang out with and um he's like then we practiced hard and we got ready for this gig and we you know and here we are and and that you know and and i didn't even think about it then as crowdsourcing but it's exactly what it was you know and and, and to take you know a, a story even like a craigslist ad story even further i i would imagine most of the people on the um listening to this are millions and millions of fans across the world uh you know <laughs> certainly know of the band uh, the lumineers right so the, the lumineers mm -hmm. same exact thing they found their cellist the uh, the female vocalist uh they found her through a craigslist ad you know so it's like that kind of stuff is still happening today and still helping bands form up so for me it was a bit more before i even got into crowdsourcing formally but that that story sticks with me and uh and i'm sticking with it that's awesome yeah that kind of shows how uh you know crowdsourcing isn't just for developing apps or whatever right it, it extends to to pretty much everything right music in your case great <laughs> i want to talk a little bit about what is top coder because we keep mentioning top coder and if uh you know whoever is listening to us right now uh isn't familiar with top coder i want you to understand what it is that we do um and just kind of give you the lowdown on all that so i want to first i know we've said it probably a hundred times so far in the podcast but i'm going to say it again just because i i really value transparency and being uh being clear with uh with the audience uh we all work for top coder uh we would love you to come and crowdsource with top coder but we don't need you to come crowdsource with top Coder. we just want you to crowdsource in general right um our goal isn't to be a commercial for Top Coder. Our goal is to talk about the industry. Uh, we're going to talk about other vendors in the space. Um, we just wanted you to experience it and find your aha moment. Like we just shared all of ours uh, with crowdsourcing. But um, with that, I do think it's important to understand what it is Top Coder does. Uh, so we kind of have, we're a two sided marketplace. Uh, we have you know a customer side, and then we have a community side of it. So I'm going to uh, hand it off to the respective experts on those two sides to talk a little bit more about those. Um, you know, a minute each, you guys. So Clinton, what do we do for our top coder customers? So customers, the the the, the quick spiel is kind of simple, right? Everybody has some sort of pain point when it comes to developing, or designing, or developing something. Like you just can't get to certain talent whether that's UI, UX creatives who really help you explore a front end, quality developers in, in the stack you're working in when you need them, or like just really brainiac data scientists that can help you optimize an algorithm or uh, do some predictive analytics. So for customers, it's pretty simple. We have uh, a business conversation, figure out what the heck they're trying to accomplish. We have a process of taking real world problems, digesting them and, and representing them as um, crowdsourcing challenges and then we host crowdsourcing challenges to procure really good results uh that is the as as quick and as you know <laughs> as skinny a, a definition as i can give you but that's it we do that on repeat so whether it's some of our largest clients or somebody coming off the street for the first time trying us the process is the process look at the work break it down host competitions for the stuff you got to go get done and allow really passionate really good people to get around the work and perform and I just want to add one thing to the customer side of it. And uh, it, it doesn't matter how big or small you are as a customer or as, as a user on Top Coder. You, you can be one person trying to uh, figure out what sort of app you want to create if you have this brilliant idea, but you need that technical expertise. 
or you can be a giant enterprise uh, that wants to create a program for crowdsourcing delivery of applications or designs internally. So those can both be supported. I think uh, you know we do, no one's excluded. Uh, yeah. you're, no matter how how big or small you are. Yeah, so as these uh, customer projects are coming in, you know, they, they need to be worked on, and that's where the community comes in. Uh, the community loves the work. I mean, we have so many different types of challenges that you could just kind of be an expert in one of them and just do those type of challenges. Um, we have different ones. First to finish would just be a really, like, fast code challenge. You know, we have things from design. We have algorithms. If you need... Uh, some algorithm optimized let's say that could be an option so we have like members in in all of these types of categories and and they what they love about top coder is you know for one the prizes are pretty good um and the other thing is it's it's a little different than other i would call them crowdsourcing sites where they might need to kind of pitch themselves and be like yeah i can uh, i can do your uh, project for a thousand bucks and you know someone else is like I can do it for 900 so instead of having to auction yourself you can just everyone's invited uh, to these challenges and you do your best you get reviewed it's it's community reviewed as well and they go through a, a process to become a reviewer and so that assures the the quality that's being outputted to the customer as well so um, it's largely community run which is which is pretty awesome from uh, organizing the projects to to reviewing them and and sending them back to the client um but our again our community loves us not only for the prizes we do a bunch of fun events for them as well we recently had this flood of love uh challenge we had one for design and development kind of like make your own valentine's day card um and the other one was create a web app that was like a valentine's slash top coder themed mad lib and and those went off uh pretty great we had we had a great time we did a live show with them you know asked people for some words to include in these mad libs and uh and and we had a blast we we do events like this for the community we have uh the top coder open which is our uh annual event um just in the past couple years we've been doing regional events which is awesome we're bringing um what was once a one year event closer to, to all of our um, members. So we'll have, uh, we'll go to Russia, we'll go to India, Indonesia, China, um, you know, we'll, we'll host one in the U S as well. So we have these little uh, competitions, help you uh, earn some more points to actually earn a free trip to our finals that always takes place in the United States. Um, And so they get really excited about that. Every competition, every challenge that they compete in, that they earn money, they earn points to to go to these uh, events. And, and we have members all over the world that just try real hard. They love coming to these events. And um, uh, they, they feel like Top Coder really is a, a community, a, a family almost for some of them, uh, the people that they get to see and meet every year. A lot of them become friends. It's... It's quite, I can tell you some stories and maybe we'll save that for some of the episodes later. But, uh, <laughs> but yes, uh, that's pretty much what, how our members view uh, Top Coder as a platform. All right. So that is Top Coder 101. Uh, keep tuning into our future episodes. I'm sure you'll hear a whole lot more about how we do it uh, as well as the other vendors in the space. Uh, so we want to wrap up today's episode uh, with a segment that we're going to try and do uh, every every time we record, uh, and we're just going to call it the cool crowd thing. We're going to think of a better name. Maybe we'll crowdsource a better name. If you have a better name, please contact like us and let us know. The cool, <laughs> cool crowd, crowd thing. thing. For episode one, it's the cool crowd thing, and you the guys C- are going to have to live with that. The CCT, dude. The CCT. Come on. It's all good. Dun 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 dun. <laughs> the cool crowd thing segment uh, is designed to just look across uh, the industry uh, and the world and figure out what sort of cool things have happened in crowdsourcing recently. Uh, and you know, maybe since the last episode was recorded, uh, we're recording today on February fifteenth, twenty seventeen. Uh, Clint- and I think Clinton brought today's cool crowd thing for us to discuss. Clinton, what do you have? I think taking this back to the top, where we talked about some of the history of. Well, these things used to take years and years and years, and, and you could only, you know, and, and these big game-changing things, very, very cool. Like in, we said, fast-forwarding, where, where are we today? Well, the, the, the cool crowd thing we're going to talk about is this, um, this prize that 
that Amazon recently put out. It's actually called the Amazon Alexa Prize. It is this 2.5 million, which is a pretty darn large number, uh, 2.5 million dollar competition that they're putting out to help advance conversational AI, you know, artificial intelligence. Obviously, AI and chatbots and, and everything, everything that kind of goes into um, that burgeoning technology is just absolutely on fire. Voice recognition, natural language progression. Uh, it is a, it is a as hot as hot can be in, in the world of, of technology. So. Amazon's jumping on the crowdsourcing bandwagon. They put out this $2.5 million prize, and it's pretty cool. It's very, it's very like X Prize like in the sense that they put out this big, bold initiative, and they don't really give too many rules around it. They just say go chase that big, that big uh, goal line. And in this case, um, the goal is to be able to, to create intelligent <clears throat> AI software that can have a conversation for for at least 20 minutes with a human. Wow. On popular topics and like and so so I don't know exactly how they're gonna grade what's a um, intelligent conversation because trust me I'm on Twitter and I see lots of unintelligent conversations <laughs> in 140 characters that have nothing to do with a bot so so that'll be interesting to see how they grade that but they've uh, opened it up to 12 different universities like uh, like CMU and Princeton and, and it's all out there some really really cool stuff I mean a it's likely gonna advance the space B it's Amazon, so that's just cool. And C, you know, it, it's in such a it's um it's such a big prize, like two point five million is a lot of money to go to go win this thing. So uh, there's more details out there. It's actually best way to go look at it's uh, developer.amazon.com slash Alexa Prize. But for this week, we thought because of the coolness, because of it being Amazon, this would be the cool crowdsourcing story of the week. That's awesome. And I mean, 20 minutes is a long time. Uh, we might be able to add a fourth chair to the podcast once this thing's done. We can just <laughs> buy an Alexa and put it in front of a mic or an Echo and put it in front of a mic. I mean, I, we, we, we've been recording for 40 minutes now, and I can tell you half it has not been intelligent. So that, that, is, a hard, <laughs> that is a hard thing to do. I agree, right? All right. Well, thank you for sharing that, Clinton. The Alexa Prize. Uh, stay tuned on that one. I'm sure we'll probably come back to it uh, when they finish up. I think winners are announced uh, in November of this year. So uh, hopefully we're still chucking along. I'm certainly planning on it. And uh, we'll, we'll catch you guys up when we start hearing more from Amazon on it. So with that, I think that is the end of episode one of the Loud About Crowdsourcing podcast. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in and listening. Uh, please leave us feedback and reviews on whichever podcast service you're listening on. Uh, we are available on iTunes and Google Play, uh, as well as at podcast.topcoder.com. Uh, you can visit that URL also if you want to get introduced to crowdsourcing with TopCoder, uh, just podcast.topcoder.com. If you want to email us, you can reach the three of us at podcast at topcoder.com. Uh, and we can also be reached on Twitter, uh, Clinton, Twitter, go. Sure, it's at Clinton Bonds. My last name's Bonner, uh, so C L I N T O N B O N. So at Clinton Bond on Twitter, I will be mostly talking about the Seahawks uh, and other fun stuff. And I'm promoting this. Uh, and this and tacos. tacos. Yeah, lots of tacos. <laughs> Awesome. And uh, you can catch me at Hokey Nick, H O K I E Nick, N I C K. I will be posting more about crowdsourcing, I think. This is, this is going to be my main account to post all about crowdsourcing. You guys will love it. And you can find me at Will underscore Price. Uh, you'll probably see me saying a whole lot of nothing until I kick myself in the butt and start tweeting more. Uh, I got to work on that. That's one of my <laughs> one of my goals now that we've launched. Uh, so, but feel free to reach out to me, uh, and you'll probably see me uh, tweeting about my Boston sports or uh, crowdsourcing initiatives that we have going on at Top Coder as well. So, uh, with that, thanks again for tuning in. Please, please give us your feedback. We definitely want to hear it. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing you next time on Loud About Crowdsourcing. Thanks, everyone.